from uh, with a quote. Um, we're gonna maybe we'll come back to this, but uh, a couple of mornings ago, we had a breakfast here as part of Ad Week where we brought the author of um, the Economist special report on advertising technology, and in the the piece on programmatic, um, it's called uh, Bye Bye Baby. Uh, the piece ended with a quote uh, that you gave. I believe it was media is today laying the trace path for how we interact with information-based services in every category of endeavor. Um, you know, I, I think for those of us who are reading The Economist on a, on a Sunday, uh, you know, that's just sort of like, <laughs> um, what, you know, what did you mean by that? Could you unpack I, I that? Mean, as, so I spent the first half of my career writing pieces like that piece, right? So I wrote pieces about technology. I wrote, I was at, while I was editing Wired, I also made a point of trying to write at least, I wrote a column every month and I wrote a feature story every quarter just to stay fresh. Uh, and thank God for blogging because I still get to write and that's where that comes from is a piece that I wrote. Um, and what, what I was trying to... called the Why the Banner Ad is Why Heroic. the Banner Ad is Heroic uh, and uh, uh, the greatest artifact of our uh, technological uh, culture, something to that effect. Um, and and the, the idea was, first of all, at Wired we um, uh, we have the uh, sort of uncertain honor of uh, having invented the banner. Um, and we fight, Tim O'Reilly and I, uh, who's with my partner for many years on a conference called Web2, uh, we fight because the, he had GNN at the time and he did a banner too, and so, you know, <laughs> who was first? History is written yeah. by the victors. Right. right. <laughs> um, he's doing very well. Um, uh, and uh, anyways, but <clears throat> I, I kind of was... I was having a think about um, what were we doing uh, in this in the industry. We had uh, at Federated um, purchased uh, Legit, which was a, an advertising exchange and a supply side platform. So it aggregated inventory that we then uh, traded programmatically. Um, and I I just had a feeling this was super important when we bought it, and you know for tons of money in two. 2011, um, to the point where we bet our whole company on, right? Our whole company, because I had 120 salespeople and associated um, uh, support people, direct salespeople who were at Federated. At Federated. And, um, y you know, it, you could just see this sort of glide path happening where no matter how hard they spun their wheels, we were not getting lift off on the direct sold display marketplace. We invented native advertising. We, you know, we tried everything we could, bells and whistles. Uh, in the meantime, this programmatic thing was just doing this, and I, I just thought it was so important. But the more I thought about it, uh, and the more I thought about the, um, the things that, uh, that were really being done, mm -hmm. um, it goes back to that slide you showed uh, about the New York Stock Exchange versus programmatic. Um, advertising is, it, in a programmatic sense, is, is simply figuring out the right message at the right time, in the right context, mm -hmm. in real time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and that is the trace path for an entire, um, you know, uh, superset of potential uh, engagements between people mm -hmm. uh, and between machines and between machines and machines and machines and people. Um, and, and then I started, whoa, you know, this is one of those things, we, I have a section of my site which if you really, you know, have no time uh, but time to waste, you should read called uh, Joints After Midnight. And, and th this was one of those kinds of whoa ideas, like, oh, dude, you know. And I was like, start, oh, I've got to write this or I'm not going to, you know, it's going to escape, you know. I'm going to lose it into the ether of a late night, right, when you have those conversations, you wake up and go, I know we said something really important, but I can't remember what it was. And you, um, and you also gave a talk on this at Berkeley. Yes, uh, yes, well. at Berkeley. Uh, they Another invited place me. Where so at the engineering school, which was I think that's joints, fun. joints of performance. <laughs> yeah, <at> yeah. <laughs> exactly. It was performance art. It went very well. And, uh, I, was, I was a bit scared. A room full of, like, you know, PhD and, and a master's in engineering. It was like, you know, how am I going to pull this off? You know, I'm a writer, which I consider coding, um, by the way. Just different kind of coding. But, um, so I thought, you know, God, the programmatic is basically going to be the, the, the underpinning of how, um, you know, events occur, like turning up your thermostat, getting into your car, going to the doctor, going to any government service. That will be 10 years later than everything else, of course, but it will happen. Um, and any place where there is value exchanged, 
um, and the in and the overlay of, of information uh, makes that value uh, more valuable. Uh, it's just going to happen, but we need a huge infrastructure to process that. Mm -hmm. We need something far exceeding the, uh, the, the stock exchanges of the world. Um, first of all, it needs to be open, needs to be transparent, needs to be auditable, can't be completely littered with dark pools and high frequency trading. It has to be you know, a, a, an auditable, trustworthy system. Um, and it struck me that we were building it. Um, we just kind of hadn't said that we were building it because we built it for banner ads. We, we built this amazing system, but we built it to, uh, to put, you know, ads no one wants to look at in front of you. Um, and and I, look, I've made most of my career on that. On that. Um, and, and I think that at the end of the day, real estate is real estate. Uh, impressions are impressions. What you do with them and how you make them valuable has to do with the information that you have at the moment that you can present that value. And, and up until very recently, the reason we didn't like banner ads was simply that they weren't useful, they weren't uh, actionable, they didn't add value to your life, and therefore they, we became blind to them. So, so on that point of um, auditability, uh, I think you know one of the pieces uh, for those of us who are followers of your blog that you wrote almost now uh, two years ago, in January 2013, was about the issue of fraud. It's time to call out fraud on the ad tech ecosystem was the title of that one. I got, it made me a lot of friends. <laughs> so I think, you know, a few people in this room might have been on the, uh, you know, the, the business end of that, of that stick. Yeah. Tell us, you know, uh, at first, what, what, did you, what were the implications for your own business? You weren't uh, certainly a neutral observer. Um, no, I was, was in no a neutral observer, and I was spurred on by an earlier piece written by the CEO of Sovereign, uh, Walter Knapp. Um, we basically said the same thing. Um, and he wrote it in, I don't know if it was this day or I mean, or one of these uh, trade publications. But um, he and I and our board really were, were grappling with this issue. So, um, you know, we have, we run from the mid to the long tail. That's our kind of where we live. And I'm a huge champion of independent voices, having, you know, being one. You know, I mean, my average monthly uniques, as it were, is about 30,000, you know. Um, and, and now I think those 30,000 people are like the coolest people in the world. Tim, Tim O'Reilly, <laughs> you know, yeah, people yeah, right. yeah, you know, yeah, but on the other hand, um, when I started blogging in 2003, 4, 5, uh, I had 300,000. Um, and the reason was I was like the only guy writing about search at the time, me and Dan Sullivan. Um, and, and, and then, you know, I went off and did other things and sort of only posted a couple of times a week. But still, 30,000 is 30,000, right? And, and people. You know, that's groceries for a month, or that's, you know, it should be. Mm -hmm. And then I, what I noticed was happening, and this is what, got, this is what set me off, is um, everyone I was talking to uh, about our business, uh, Federated and, uh, and now Sovereign, um, was saying, there's just too much inventory. There's just, there's a lot of inventory. There's so much inventory that's really not worth that much because there's so much of it. And especially like down the tail, there's 200 million blogs, and who cares? And, I just thought to myself, no, that's impossible. There's only so much time that human beings can spend consuming media. So it's impossible that there's too much. There's something wrong here. And what it is is that it turns out that a shit ton of it are robots that are consuming this media and creating this inventory. And there is too much inventory that is bad. There is. But because there's so much of it, and because marketers were wittingly or perhaps whistling by the graveyard, um, un, you know, unwittingly or wittingly or just whistling, um, uh, we're paying for the bad stuff because the bad stuff is smart. And the bad stuff was, you know, and this is me kind of like getting outraged that something was dead, dead obvious to almost everybody else. But, you know, I'm like, whoa, another one of those moments. And I said, so, so how much of this? And I started talking to people. I started kind of, you know, talking to CEOs of, of the companies we all know that are, you know, very large um, and very well funded. And said, ah, you know, it, it ranged, you know, depending on who you spoke with, it ranged from, you know, we have it under control. It's probably 15 to 20 percent mm -hmm. to 70 percent. Okay, some of the video stuff was like 60 to 70 percent, right? And I was like, how is it no one's talking about this? Well, then you just 
run the game theory. You just look at the economics. Nobody was getting hurt. Everyone was winning. Mm -hmm. The robots are really good at checking KPI boxes. Really good at visiting the GM website, picking up that little cookie, and then getting retargeted, like the robot retarget, you know, boom. Really good at viewing to complete on the video, right? And so no one was getting hosed. Everyone was making money. For, you know, the, the marketers were getting the KPIs, the products were still getting sold. Some, you know, the, you know, the, the, the agencies were getting paid, you know, the, the, all that massive loom escape that was digesting the money all the way through to the publisher was getting their big. The guys that were getting screwed were the little independent guys. Because their 30,000 you know, super high household income, super intelligent influencer audiences were getting sold for 30 cent CPMs. And that pissed me off. And I thought, you know what will happen? I bet if we clean that fraud out, those guys' CPMs are going to increase. And I swear, I can I've never said this publicly, but it's true. The average CPM on our network has gone up 3x since we took it all out. Wow. Now, it has not replaced the revenue hit that we took. But we took it, and we took it like hard three times over a whole year, because it keeps getting back in. It's and, sneaky. And who, so to that end, clearly someone's willing to pay more, a higher ECPM. So what's changed in terms of what KPIs are being hit that the inventory that's available through the sovereign uh, yeah. holdings is now able to command a higher ECPM? Um, so About two years later, it takes a long time for you know for the whole system to start to recognize the value of the inventory, right? And of course, it takes us going to market and making uh, that point. And we, I think we have a long way to go to continue that process to go to market on it. But um, what happened was is I think at the same time that we and many others in our I mean, I think it's amazing that as an industry, the progress we've made on, on fraud in the last two years. Um, uh, or a year and a half, but uh, you know, we started to talk to our customers about it and say, you know, we created whitelists, massive tens of thousands of, of domains of whitelists, um, and we said, try this, don't you know, and and not that, try this. And I'm like, hey, you know, the, you know, sometimes they say, well, the actions are lower, and like, what are your KPIs? Okay, are they gameable? Okay, change them. Right. Right. Um, you know, is it viewable? Um, are the actions the kind of actions that humans take as opposed to the ones that you know, check boxes and so on? Um, and so it's it's increasingly gotten better. Um, and I think there's, as I said, a long a long way up, a long way up to go, particularly as we start to create you know sort of understandable private marketplaces, which was a great idea three years ago that no one really did. Um, because there was just too much easy money to be made. Mm -hmm. But I think now uh, that is a very, it's a first look or a private marketplace or, or just an open call or however you want to do it, it's, it's, um, it, it's happening now. But, um, so obviously, you know, you wrote, literally wrote the book on search, uh, you know, over a decade ago. What do you see, and I, I think in the beginning, I'm not sure if you were here, I was you know, talking about the database of intentions, is uh -huh. what you called Thanks Google. Thanks for the name for the, check, yeah, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> just in case. And uh, so, you know, what do you see as, as what's similar yeah. about um, search and yeah. what we see now with programmatic and, and what's different? Well, so bridging from fraud is an excellent little segue. <laughs> uh, when Google went public, the industry standard number on fraud was 20%. So Google went public on that. They didn't clean it all up by the time. You know, they had a huge SEO, SEM marketplace the ecosystem, you know, I mean, tons of small businesses had popped up to service this ecosystem. Everyone was on it, hundreds and hundreds. I think, they, I think by the time they uh, were public, they had a million customers using it, you know. Um, and, you know, an army of people taking advantage of it, creating great markets of, of, of link, link swap and link bait and all that great stuff. So there was a lot of fraud in the system when they were public. Um, and then they cleaned it up, and you know, I've talked to, I talked at that, we had a lunch that after I wrote that piece, we ended up having a lunch at the IEB, which is like a kind of a magnetic <laughs> was there, and there were some other folks there, and, and all the CEOs of all the ad tech companies were there. Um, and so with Neil Mullen from Google, and I asked him, you know, doesn't this feel somewhat similar, you know, back in the day, when we were, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago in the search market? And he's like, yeah. And I said, so what's your search fraud at now? And he's like, well, I'm not allowed to tell you because it's a secret. You know, I'm like, but it's sub five percent, right? He's like, yeah, it's noise in the system. I said, so how many engineers do you have working on the problem? 
full time. He said thousands. Wow. He has thousands of people who work just on making sure that the ecosystem is clean. So we are in the beginning, our industry, of, of having thousands of people. We are a far more distributed industry. We don't just have one player who owns this space and has consolidated it and has all those engineers you know, in Mountain View. Mm -hmm. right? So we need to work together as, a, as an industry, and that's different from, from the way search played out. I mean, sure, there are these monster gorillas in the room, Google, now Facebook, uh, Twitter's building their stack, you know, Amazon is not talking about it, but they're furiously building it, um, and, uh, and I expect more. Um, so it's great, it's far more um, robust because you've got a hybrid figure, you know, you've got more uh, organisms competing. And it's, it's certainly more fragmented, right? Yeah, you've got AppNexus and you've got, you know, Rocket Fuel buying X, and you've got, you know, Axiom, and, or it's a big industry, it's a big ecosystem, and those big dudes, the IBMs and the SAPs and the Oracles, they see what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. They understand that marketing is the tip of this very long sphere that is about the ITization of interaction, human interaction, and machine to machine interaction. And it, it seems that um, I think one thing we spoke about when we chatted a week ago was that you know programmatic and you know, RTB infrastructure as being the premise for it's not just you know in the case of search ultimately it's very simple you're searching for you know a website you get a list of search results in the case of programmatic there's a lot more being carried over these pipes right. I think I shared with you the story of we have one client that's not shipping uh, you know it's not shipping actually ads over the pipes they're shipping URL redirects. Um, they built a marketplace for URL redirection on the back of an RTB um, framework. One of the things we met, we talked about was content and content marketing, and how um, you know you, you had this story that you shared about the Forever Twenty One. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. And so maybe. Yeah, this is my. <clears throat> so when we, yeah, when we when we go into the you know late night uh, smoke session and think about these big thoughts, it's great, but it doesn't. If you got to bring it to the. To, the, to something that, that, that actually makes sense. So I use this scenario, I, I call it the Forever 21 scenario. I don't know if you guys have heard it before. I don't want to bore you, but I'll try I, to tell I shop there. I, I, I know. <laughs> well, so <clears throat> one of the things that I love to think, I like to think about how brands express themselves to their consumers and potential customers um, uh, individually. Um, this idea of mass personalization is kind of the goal of most large brands. Um, and you know, you or me going to February 21, we deserve a different experience than my daughter, who's 16, who goes to Forever 21. Our experience should be 45 seconds long. <laughs> That's about as much time as I spend in there before I just lose my like not It's a hostile environment for a dad. Um, however, a dad who wants to impress his daughter and get this gift for her and have has made the sort of social capital call of going into the store and getting that thing, as opposed to just getting it off of Amazon, right? That's like makes me cool that, right? So I'm gonna do that, but 45 seconds is like my goal. So if I'm Forever 21, I wanna give me a 45 second experience, and if my daughter wanders into the store, I wanna give her a 45 minute experience. Now, what you have to do is reorder your store using data, technology, platforms, and business rules in real time. Reorganize your store the way that Google reorganizes that page based on the search term. Mm -hmm. And the search term is the person and the information surrounding that person. When you go through that door, the search happens and the whole store reorganizes. So how does that work? Well, so here's the, here's the dad version of it, right? So I'm going in to Forever 21. I kind of cross through the portal and my phone starts buzzing, of course. And I was going to pull it out of my pocket anyways. All the technology that I'm about to describe exists. And by the way, Foursquare's dead in the center of it, right? So I pull out my phone and, you know, the first thing I see is like six notifications from competing retailers to Forever 21 that say, don't go in, I've got 20 <laughs> <laughs> And I get rid of those because I'm going in for a very specific item that I know my daughter wants. Maybe she liked it on Facebook or maybe she, she, she made some declaration, a piece of data that said she wanted this sweater thingy that drops off her shoulder and shows her bra strap. <laughs> um, and so that's what I'm getting, the sweater thingy, right? And, and I go in and, 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 and I swipe that out and instantly there is an in-store map that shows me exactly where I need to go to get to that sweater, right? 
all the clerks, when I come in, their phones light up with my profile. And it says, do not engage. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because I don't want to look at them because they just make me feel bad. They're like pretty and young and like trying to be helpful and I don't, <laughs> I don't need help. I have my, I'm staring at my phone, they see that I'm staring, they know they don't need to help, right? Okay, great. So now I go straight to the aisle, you know, the wall O sweaters, right? Which is a terrifying wall. It's, you pull the wrong one out, it falls on you. you know? So I'm like, oh, I don't know which one it is. So I hold the phone up and of course it lights around the one that I'm supposed to get, right? I pull that out, put my phone down, I tuck that under my arm and I walk towards the door, and at the door, they've got like a really nice, um, uh, you know, clerk, retail clerk, who has a bag and maybe some, you know, gift wrap and a little tissue and says, here, Mr. Vitell, and I stick it in the bag and I get like a big grin because it's been 34 seconds and it was like a good experience, and I walk out the door. I don't pay because that's all done here, right? Apple Pay just happened last week or the week before. All that stuff exists now. Right? I'm just debited, it's done, I've got my gift, it was 34 seconds. You know, that's, the, that's creating a customer experience based on programmatic infrastructure and, and real-time data. And all the data exists, all the programmatic infrastructure exists, all the uh, you know, knitting that we need to make that happen exists, but the marketers who have to make that happen live in a silo where they have no control over what happens in retail, no control over what happens with the CIO's office, no control over the direct marketing channel, the CRM, which is over here in this other silo. So what we have to do is take marketing and turn it horizontally and put it across the whole organization. And when that happens, that scenario will occur. And it's already happening in some ways in places like Burberry and Jax, and there are places where it's happening because I keep sort of seeing this, tracking this. But I wrote that scenario that I just told you about six years ago, and I called it the gap scenario. Because gap is cool. <laughs> gap is cool. Your daughter was 10. Yeah, my dad, daughter was 10, and she thought gap was cool. And you know, I'm sure Forever 21 is over now, too, and I, I have to come up with a, a, new, a new retail outlet. And, and so in that, you know, I think that kind of comes back around to what, um, you know, what we wanted to end on, which was, uh, I know David, uh, one of my colleagues here, was having drinks with uh, John Eber, who writes the Ad Exchanger blog. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it could be considered another mid to long tail publisher. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe has 30,000 uniques. Uh, most a little more, but it's <laughs> yeah, doing great. Um, and you know, I think uh, we mentioned that you know, we were having this event um, this week. And he said, you know, apart from that sort of futuristic view of, of the programmatic uh, pipes becoming, I think the, the frame, uh, phrase that you used was, you know, the commercial fabric for the Internet of Things, right? Mm -hmm. Where our self-driving cars are negotiating which lane to go in on the 101 between Mountain View and, and Marin. Um, you know, what, what does it look like in, in reality? I mean, this, this story I think is a great anecdote, but maybe end on, like, what does it mean for the people in this audience in 20 years? So 20 years ago, we're coming up now on the two-decade anniversary of the first banner, yeah. right? I mean, it's scary to think 20 years we've had a banner. It's this one. <laughs> it was October '94, I think, when we did that. The first AT and T, I will, you will. Have you ever clicked on? Have you ever clicked right here? You will. Not. So, <laughs> 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 better still there, in the, and we're still waiting for that you will moment yeah. ask to click on it. Um, I think someone said that you're more likely to get, you know, uh, to survive a car, uh, plane crash than you are to click on a banner ad. Is, uh, so, so 20 years, that is a Digiday uh, quote from a few months back. So, um, what, you know, what do you see in 20 years hence? Uh, how, how does this story of the Forever 20, which I think is very palpable, what does it mean for some of the folks in this audience who maybe like, you know, your role at Sovereign or publishers? Uh, on the other hand, we've got, you know, John, uh, here, who is from Kellogg's as a marketer, yeah. what, what are some of the implications um, for where it's going? Well, I think, uh, I hope, 20 years from now, what, what marketers have done is, is, is completely widen their tool bag. I like to say that marketers, you know, are going to run everything, um, and, and the reason is, is that marketing, for the most part, besides communications, which is closely aligned with marketing, and investor relations, which is and is not, um, is the place that you have conversations with customers, right? and with a place where you derive insights about those customers and create marketing based on those insights. You should be, of course, creating all of your customer experiences and all of your products based on those insights. But the companies I've noticed that 
actually use marketing insights in product development are few and far between. The ones that do it are what I call information first companies. And information first companies are ones, you know, so companies are sort of these living ecosystems that um, uh, require flows of information, flows of matter, commodity, you know, stuff that you make stuff out.